Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Going Analog podcast, where four board gamers come together, each with his or her own topic for the group to discuss. We have new topics every two weeks, and this week, we actually have a special guest. So uh, rest in peace, Nick Sutner. He's not with us this week, uh, but he stepped aside momentarily so we can have a special guest on, uh, a famous game designer. I'm not going to get your head uh, blown up too big there, but... Uh, we have a famous game designer on board this week. So uh, my name is Shu. I am your host. And this week's topic for me, I want to talk about games that everyone seems to love, but you, right? Like, what are the games that all of your friends seem to love, but you don't like quite like them yourself? So uh, that's my topic that I'm going to bring to the table. But I want to introduce first, before we get to our regular guys here, uh, a, our special guest this week is Jonathan Gilmore. John, say hi. Hello. So we have become friends. We actually, I first got to know you, John, because I backed Dinosaur Island, which is one of your uh, more recent hits. Uh, and I backed it on a Kickstarter and I just put it out on Facebook. And I said, I'm a backer of Dinosaur Island. And then you said, thank you for backing my game. And I'm like, wait a minute. And then I, it's like, I had, it like took me a second to process this. I'm like, wait, I'm Facebook friends with this guy who's also designed, like, I would think you're probably your most famous game is Dead of Winter, which is a popular zombie game. And uh, so I was like, oh, holy crap. I didn't realize we we're even Facebook friends. And then you noticed that post and then we got to start talking. And now uh, we've seen each other at a couple of conventions and we played games together and we're friends now. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great. Yeah. So, uh, and then we recently on a recent episode of going to analogs podcast, uh, we talked about kids on bikes, which is a RPG released by renegade game studios that you designed. And then, uh, so you ran us through one of those sessions, a session of kids on bikes at Gen Con, which is a big game convention a couple of months ago. And we talked about that. So we won't get into too much of that now, but the game just came out recently. So look for that. If you're interested in the kind of stranger things, Goonie-esque uh, role-playing game. Uh, really interesting take on the genre. So uh, you're the designer of that too. And I, I also mentioned Dead of Winter, which I think we're going to talk about in this show a little bit later, so we won't talk too much about that. Uh, John, so why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, some of the other games you've designed, and then tell us what your topic is. So I've been a board game designer for probably about eight years now, and I've been doing it full-time maybe the last three years, I think is when I went full-time. Um, I've got, I think, 12 releases out now. So a couple of the other things that I have are Path of Light and Shadow um, and Wasteland Express Delivery Service. Um, and my topic this week is going to be about uh, how board games can evoke experiences, because I think that's one of the really exciting things about board games. Cool. Cool. All right. Thanks for coming on. I know it's uh, past midnight for you right now, so we appreciate you staying up late for us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Christina. Uh, say hello, introduce yourself, and then tell us what your topic is. Hi, I'm Christina. Um, so this week I wanted to talk about, uh, mainly since we, we used to host a lot of board game nights and try to introduce board games to friends or just have you know already hardcore board game uh, friends come over and play games, I just want to talk about how we as pretty experienced board game hosts sort of curate that experience. I, I, I met a new friend. It was a weird sort of... Uh, friend blind date once and I was trying to explain sort of how I see my role as a board game person and I said like especially for new players but also for like friends who do like games I sort of explained like I'm like a board game sommelier right so like I'm gonna think about what what tastes you like types of um, interesting things you do and how I might pick board games that would appeal to your tastes so I wanted to pick everybody's brains and talk about that. Oh, thanks. And then Mike, introduce yourself and tell us about your topic. Sure. Hey, guys, this is Mike Zipkin. And um, so this week I wanted to bring up the topic of uh, favorite games that I like to bring out during Halloween because I feel like there are so many great horror themed board games. And um, Halloween is like a great time that I love to get everybody together because we're all as we all get older. I, my friends and I, we don't have time to go out dancing and partying anymore. And my idea of a good time is kind of just staying home and having a few drinks and playing a scary game and spending time with friends. All right, Mike, that sounds awesome. It's actually, I think our preferred social life too is not going out dancing and staying home and playing board games as well. Uh, so why don't you start us off, uh, get into your topic and then let's discuss your scary games. 
there's a lot there's so many scary board games out there to choose from and i really want to like hear your guys's thoughts as well as we get into this and i know uh john has a lot of interesting things to talk about during his topic that's kind of tangentially related to what makes a good scary board game scary and you know how you actually invoke um horror in a game and make it feel like thematically you know uh powerful so uh, but yeah, so like I, I, I do I do tend to like to, to get people together to play these scary games. And I even have like a shelf dedicated to horror games. And um, so, yeah, so one of the first games that I, I definitely thought of when I was researching this topic and that I always like to play every Halloween is uh, Fury of Dracula, uh, which I know that Shu, you have a copy of and we've played it at your house once. Yeah, that's a that's a good, interesting choice. I didn't think about that one, but that's a pretty good one. Yeah, I mean, Fury of Dracula is perfect because. Uh, as far as this is more of like a gamery game, so you're definitely going to be committing to a bit of an evening to one game. Um, you might be able to like start something, maybe start the night off with something shorter, uh, or the end of the night, you know, with something lighter, but this is definitely a meatier game for, for gamery gamers. <laughs> and, uh, so this is one where one player is playing as Dracula and the other players are playing as, you know, Van Helsing. And a few other sort of uh, Transylvania, you know, <laughs> he's the only one I can remember, too. He's the yeah. only one I can think of. <laughs> Van Helsing and, and others. Van Helsing and co. Yeah. And uh, so you're all so the, the three or four humans, it's a two to five player game. So you have one player is playing Dracula and that person is their their character is not represented on the board until they're found. It's a it's what's called a hidden movement game. And so Dracula is trying to hide and trying to basically you know uh i don't know what would you say the goal of the, i can't remember the exact goal of the game is just to kill the other players yeah the, the hunter has to or the vampire has to survive but the hunters have to hunt, track and hunt down and kill dracula which actually makes for me it's actually like uh, that's a good choice and then i thought about it, i'm like well it's actually not that scary i think it's actually scarier for the Dracula player than the other players, even though Dracula has like other vampires and, and, and minions that is Beck and Paul, and he could turn into like a wolf and, and, and prowl and stuff like that. But he's the one getting hunted. I think he, he's the <laughs> one that should be scared because it's like all these people like slowly, like across the map, slowly kind of cornering him in and getting into a corner and then they beat up on him. Like <laughs> every game I played of that, Dracula has lost badly. Well, I think you might be playing it wrong then, or you just aren't the one that should be playing as Dracula, because I think Dracula can be, <laughs> Dracula should be, you know, is a very powerful character. And as the game progresses, he just gets even more and more powerful. And so it's all about the day night phase. And so there's like certain actions players can take during the day and they can move during the day, but they can't move at night. And Dracula gets more and more powerful. So I, I find that one is, is a great one because it just kind of builds the tension builds and coalesces as the game progresses. And um, it's just creates a really cool like uh, partnerships between the care between the players who are human. And then, you know, everybody and Dracula can sort of listen in on everybody. And uh, depending on the cards, you know, it can really be a, a force to be reckoned with. John, have you played uh, Fury of Dracula, or and do you? What would be your scary game of choice? Um, yeah, I played Fury of Dracula. I love it, and I I agree that it it, it can feel tense um, as Dracula as well. So um, there's another game, uh, uh, not to drop on a tangent, but called uh, Nuns on the Run, where all the players are hidden except for one, and it kind of flips the uh, Fury of Dracula on the head, and that kind of gets that same feeling. Um, but as far as another scary game, uh, my choice to talk about would be Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Mm -hmm. That's a good choice, too. Very atmospheric, very moody. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so uh, Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition is a cooperative game where you play investigators um, and you choose a mystery and you're trying to solve it. Um, it's heavily app-driven, so there's a app that runs um, on a tablet or a phone that basically directs the game it takes the role of like the dungeon master and that sort of game and tells you when things happen and when tiles come out and describes everything um but it's really well integrated in that it doesn't take over the tabletop experience you don't feel like you're playing a video game you there's enough things happening on the table and Mansions of Madness, we actually covered on one of the last video series when we used to do video shows. So uh, all the reviewers love that game. Uh, very good choice there. How about you, Christina? Do you have a scary game? Uh, sort of along the same veins. Like I, I really, uh, you know, that whole Lovecraft 
Iria. Um, you know, you've got Arkham Horror, Eldritch Horror, Mansions of Madness. Um, I think my personal favorite at this point is Eldritch Horror, um, just sort of like on, on a bigger scale than Mansions of Madness and without a fancy app, of course. But um, we used to have like sort of really long epic plays of Arkham Horror in which you also play investigators um, running around Arkham trying to figure out uh, what's causing these nefarious things happening and cultists sprouting up and old ones trying to rise and things like that. Um, but once Eldritch Horror came out, I think it sort of um, – you know, for me, just totally uh, took over where Arkham Horror used to um, used to live in my heart. Unfortunately, um, Eldritch Horror I felt was a lot smoother. Um, it's no longer just in Arkham anymore. It's uh, actually we, we could travel uh, along a much bigger map, but you sort of hit the same feelings of exploring these weird, nefarious um, happenings uh, with this horrible mythos deck and you draw these mythos deck events and bad things are constantly happening, but you're working cooperatively with your other investigators to figure out, you know, how can we, you know, manage some of these monsters so they don't make us lose? How do we prevent this old one from rising? And, uh, you know, can we actually win? So it's still a difficult game, but a lot smoother than Arkham Horror. Um, although there is a new edition of Arkham Horror coming out, which we found out about at Gen Con too. Um, so I'm excited for that tentatively, but I still think Eldritch Horror is, is sort of my favorite Lovecraft-themed game. Um, lots of weird, freaky things happening in it. Yeah, and all three of those games you just mentioned, uh, so Arkham Horror, Eldritch Horror, and Mansions of Madness are all done by a company called Fantasy Flight Games. And uh, I actually had Arkham Horror on my list as well to, as my scary game because they I think they do a good job with the art uh, and the atmosphere around all the graphics in the game from the box to the board and to the character sheets. Uh, and also they have flavor text for everything. And normally I'm not a flavor text kind of guy, uh, but they integrated into the thing where you have to read to somebody like, here's what's happening. Here's what you're encountering. Uh, so I, do, I think they do a good job of drawing you into the world, making it a little bit more creepy. Um, and, and the only other game I would just add myself is another game we reco- uh, we covered actually on the very first episode of our Going Analog video show called Level 7 Omega Protocol. Um, so this is sort of like, uh, if you're familiar with the video game series XCOM, it's sort of like that where there's these eight, you're a troop of Marine, like these Marines and or special ops soldiers, and you're going around trying to take out aliens. But it's creepy in the same way the video game series is where you're going down tunnels in, and there's another player who's controlling like aliens bursting out of the vents or like a cave in or then doors short circuiting and forcing you to go another way. Uh, and then you never know where these like kind of creepy crawlers are coming from. And you have limited limited firepower to take care of these guys but the aliens are uh, almost overwhelming in force so uh, i think that's a that's not a horror game per se but it does a good job of kind of just being creepy and making you feel that the, this sort of creepy aliens uh like xcom like atmosphere all right so uh that was super cool uh it's kind of an early start for halloween and uh christina let's let's take a break from all of that mood and uh, heavy mood, and let's go with your topic. So why don't you remind us what your topic is again, and then kick us off. Yeah. So my topic was talking about how everybody, you know, how what your philosophy is on, on how to host a board game night. Um, as I sort of mentioned, I, I went on this, uh, since we, we moved out to a new area, one of my friends, Shirley, uh, put me up with this sort of like uh, a blind friend date. So I went to coffee with a, with a friend I'd never met. And we were just chatting about her interests. And I was explaining about how I see myself as sort of a board game sommelier for people. You know, I've got uh, some people who are interested in the hobby and and getting into the hobby. I've met people who are like, I don't really like games. So I'm like, really? Maybe you just haven't had the right person introduce you to games. (laughs) But at the same time, we also have, you know, a lot of friends who have experience with games. So when they come over, you know, I want to keep that in mind also and think about, you know, this friend is very into theme. Um, and, you know, even if the gameplay is great, if the theme's not strong, you know, I want to make sure that I don't recommend a game that doesn't have that. On the other hand, we have a lot of friends who are really into crunchy, crunchy games, you know, Mike Zipkin, for instance. Um, and we want to. I don't know. Why would he 
Okay. <laughs> um, and especially beige covers. Uh, yeah, we, we, you know, I know that's sort of his niche. So the beige are the better. Yeah. So, you know, those are sort of things that I think about when we have a bunch of friends over. I think the biggest aspect is also the number of players. Um, Shu has a magic superpower where he remembers the number of players for each game we own. Um, so that's always really helpful for me because I can just ask him. We're like, hey, hey, Shu, how much does you know Bunny Kingdom play? How many people and stuff like that? So two, um, two to about four. A, oh, great. <laughs> So we have a lot of really great resources there. And, um, you know, our old board game organizing system was helpful, too, since we organized by um, how long uh, that game would take. So that's in general sort of what I was talking about. And I think that since all of us in this podcast right now are pretty big board game um, hosts and stuff, we, I just wanted to talk about how what you guys consider when you think about what games to bring into a board game night. So, John, you're like... I'm really curious how you do this because I, I, because Mike and Christine and I, we obviously hang out, so we're familiar with how we organize games and how we pick games. But you're a board game designer, right? And but you also play games that you don't design, obviously. Like, are you like, hey, come play my latest game or help me prototype my next game, or how do you go about picking games for your groups? Well, so um, my wife and I have been running a monthly game day uh, where we live for probably about seven years now. Wow. Um, and we've got like, we're in a very small town, but we have a Facebook group of about 200 people wow. and usually between That's like awesome. 20 and 50 people show up every month for game day. This is at your house. Yeah. Um, yeah, we usually have it at our house or at my, uh, in-laws. They have like a big outbuilding during the summer. Yeah. Don't forget you, the real estate prices there are like, you know, 10 bucks will get you an, an acre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been doing, I've been doing the exact thing you're talking about. Um, for a while I started to play prototypes at game days, but I generally try to avoid doing it at our monthly game day because a prototypes are usually bad (laughs) and they're definitely not as fun as a finished game. So, um, we started having design meetups. So I, I try to keep those two worlds separate. Um, and game day is usually like my weekend off every month. Mm -hmm. So I want to play fun games and not work. Um, but the, definitely the things that I keep in mind are, um, you know, I tried it when it's somebody new, uh, to the hobby, I try to pick a game that's a theme that they'll like. So, you know, I usually start by talking about what their interests are and, you know, what kind of things they enjoy. And I try to usually start with shorter games because, um, not everybody knows exactly where their preference is for length. So if they don't like a short game, it's over quickly. But if they want something longer, that's easier to jump into later. Yeah. And that could also help you sort of like recommend the next game. It's like you play a short game and then you say, okay, if you like that, then let's move in this direction. Or if you didn't like that, let's try something completely different. And then do you, uh, is it hard with that many people to try to entertain? Are you like, all right, let me grab three of you. Or is it like your your whole group's pretty well-versed in games so anyone could run anything? At first, it was mostly me trying to organize everything and keep people going. But there's enough people now that, you know, kind of take the lead that everybody's just running a different table and gathering people up. And you know, people kind of fall into like, well, these people play, you know, Battlestar Galactica. So that's the group I want to hang out with this month. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. How about you, Mike? I uh, I think it just it obviously I agree it, it depends on the people. Um, so with newer p- players, I think it's like we talked about in the Gateway Games episode. I'll I'll bust out something like Formula D because it's um a, like a, a very accessible theme of you know um, Formula One racing that anybody can understand, and then you're just jumping into a race car and for throwing dice and and trying to go as fast as you can without blowing up. Um, but yeah, I think when it comes to crunchier gamers, I try to find something that either I haven't played before, but that I, I know the rules really well. Um, it it kind of comes down to um, like how well I know the game and how comfortable I am, like either teaching the game or uh, how well I, I think the audience that's going to play this with me is is or how patient they are to learn the rules with me and, you know, and make sure that I have everything right. So in the case of having, you know, like a sh- like you sh- like shoe over, I would definitely try to pick something that I think that you haven't played before, and that I could definitely teach, and that I, I think you would enjoy. 
So, you know, it definitely depends on the, the taste of the players mm -hmm. and um, their patient level, patience level. Yeah, I really think it's, uh, you know, one thing that I consider too is, uh, or or I guess we do to prepare for game nights is like Shu and, Shu and I will sort of read the rules for games we're planning to play ahead of time. Um, I mean, it makes Shu fall asleep, <laughs> but, <laughs> and I'm sort of just really reluctant to do it, but when I do it, it's fine. And then um, I, I just do think it's really important to be prepared when I'm going to teach a game to new players. Um, I don't want there to be too much lag time or me trying to figure too much stuff out because it can be really off-putting for somebody who's not used to sort of working through those rules and that like every five seconds I have to go look up a rule for them, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. I know when it's people that I know that play a lot of games, um, I always enjoy trying to find games that they haven't heard of to introduce them to. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, pulling out something rare or really hard to find is a lot of fun for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely get a lot of enjoyment out of like 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 introducing something new to the group, and I think that's why we buy so many games is because I'm always chasing after the next new thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I used to have this system a long time ago where I put all my friends into one of four quadrants where the X axis would be your attention span. So you're either a high attention span gamer or you don't have much of an attention span. And then the X axis would be uh, how much you care about theme. Like some people care about theme a lot. Some people don't. And I felt like did you say they were both the X axis. Did I say two X axis? <laughs> yes. One X, one Y. You get the idea. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, and then, so if you split people into those four quadrants, you could kind of find, uh, a pretty good game like so like it's like low attention span uh they don't care about theme maybe carcassonne might be something good right or uh ticket to ride and th things like that so uh but over the years what i've started doing is when christine and i picked up a second and third gaming table we're just like sometimes we'll just throw an invite out invite as many people over in but and then we'll usually either start with big group games and then break up into smaller groups into different tables or we'll do the opposite like uh we'll end the night when everyone's kind of maybe they've been drinking all night or they've been kind of tired of playing long games then we'll end with party games where everyone's a little bit more relaxed and just having fun and taking taking everything less seriously um but sometimes in a mood for like, I want to play a heavy duty strategy game that's going to take three, four hours, then I'll just send out a small email to like, all right, I'm not inviting everybody. I know this isn't for some of my short attention span friends. And just like, I need two or three people to play Terra Mystica with me or Arkham Horror or whatever it is, some heavy game. And then, uh, and then I'll just target accordingly and then just like pick the game ahead of time and just say, this is what we're going to play. Who's in? and who's with me mm -hmm. yeah one one thing i've been trying to get better at is um deciding when to bring my own game or like who's going to get to pick the game that night because i have a standing you know weekly game night with these guys that i play with uh, some of whom have been on the show before but um, i try not to bring a game over to somebody else's house if um uh, if i've already played one of mine and i kind of get a, a little annoyed when somebody suggests like or if they bring a big bag of stuff over to my house when i they know i already have like 350 you know board games <laughs> it's like you know i'm the one hosting if if i didn't get to choose last time i think it should make sense that i get to choose but you know I try to be respectful of other people's choices too. And like not, not force my choices on them. If I already got to play one of mine. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I guess another aspect that Shu didn't mention is he also thinks about what's on our pile of shame. That's so. true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. It's like we, we prioritize the new games that we bought that we haven't played yet. So, that's that's definitely a factor. Okay, um, I'm gonna save John's topic for last because uh, th that's a really interesting one that we could go really deep on that one. So let's go to my topic next. Uh, it's another light one, which is games everyone seems to love, but you. And um, I'm like, I, I like this topic, and I realize my answers aren't necessarily very original. If you're like a maybe board game snobby like we all might be a little bit uh so like my one would be like for me is dominion which is like a, a super popular game it sort of kind of made uh deck building like the idea not magic the gathering style deck building where you're buying packs and adding to your deck but the deck building genre where within one box you can add more and more cards within a game within one session and create a better and better deck as you play uh and then you end the game but you don't have to buy additional booster packs or anything like that uh dominion was really the one that made that genre super popular i 
I thought it was okay and I didn't, but even at the time when it was brand new and there weren't a lot of other choices, I didn't think it was that great. And one of the things I didn't like was uh, in this game, you can also, you buy cards that are worth points and then those point cards go into your deck and they clutter up your hand. So where you're supposed to be building this deck that's more and more powerful and doing all these cool combinations. And then you have to balance that with just throwing in points that don't do anything for you. So I don't really like that design. And I, I like games like Ascension that does that same style of game, but better in my opinion. Uh, so that's one for me. And then the other kind of obvious answers I think that you probably hear from a lot of quote unquote snobby gamers uh, is uh, our Munchkin, uh, which is like this dungeon exploring game where you're fighting monsters, you're grabbing loot, but then you could really screw over other players. And if someone's getting ahead and they're getting close to winning, uh, it's really easy to knock them down and then try to get ahead. And it's just, it seems to devolve into nonstop, just like preventing one person from winning. And then someone just kind of stumbles across the victory line by accident by the end of the night. Uh, I used to really like that game when I didn't know any better, I think. And then I just grew really sick of it. And every munchkin that's come out seems to kind of follow the same formula. So I'm definitely over that series. And then Cards Against Humanity is another one that when I first started playing it, I loved it for about two weeks. And then I hated it when I realized like, ah, there's all the humor is just in the cards and there's no creativity being done on part of the player. Uh, so then oh, you have to keep buying expansions, man. <laughs> I know. Like you just had to keep buying more and more cards and chasing after this. So, uh, you know, I, again, I'm not saying anything new. I think a lot of people complain about those games, uh, but those are mine. Um, how about you, Mike? I mean, I feel like you know where I'm gonna where I'm gonna go with this. I do know a couple of yours. Yep. Uh, I think I'm. I have a, a problem with two particular designers, uh, Eric Lang and um, Ryan Lockett. Their games tend to fall flat for me. So, like, whenever I have a friend, and I actually I think uh, Shu would probably fall into that group where you know uh, they tend to want to play their those games a lot and then they know that whenever they are going to be playing those games they are not going to invite me (laughs) so i don't get invited to some of these get-togethers because they're going to play these games and i just find those two designers to be either very like for in in ryan lockett's case like his games just sort of feel very similar to me and like they always kind of don't really ramp up very very quickly and their the arc doesn't really i don't really find that they have a good feeling like in the arc and I like games that feel like they progress and they they build to something and then, then they end in a big you know crescendo and then like it feels like a good payoff. But I feel like Locus games kind of end with like a huh, okay. And so with and with Lang, it's kind of like a, a lot of take that uh, where you're just kind of pushing each other around. Um, so I don't tend to like those kind of games. But it's funny because your your friend uh, Steve. I've uh, you introduced me to him. He likes uh, both those designers, as do we. Christine and I are big Ryan Lockett fans. We try to collect all his games, and yeah, we have all. I think we own. We all have. Of them. I think it's impossible <laughs> to own all Eric Lang games because he makes so many. But we have a lot of his games as well. So we we'll plan. We used to plan gaming sessions with your friend behind your back because we're like, eh, Mike won't be interested. Let's just hang out without Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and that's not fair, but I, I did I do hang out with your friends without you now. So I guess that makes sense. What? Hey, what the hell? I know. You guys moved away. It's your fault. Yeah. So I sorry I interrupted you, Mike. Yeah. I'll just take one last dig at Ryan Lockett. I just I, I feel like he's kind of like the JJ Abrams of board games. Like he borrows a lot of other people's ideas and they're just not very good when they when he's, you know, done with them. I, I do love, you know, that he's I, I, I admire his uh, ability to manage all the different facets of the production from the art to the design to the promotion. I mm-hmm. have no fault with the amount of work that he does and it's phenomenal that he can make it all do it all himself. But for he's just not his games are just not for me. Hmm. Okay, and they're not for you, but you're wrong about them not being good. <laughs> I, I'm kind of on board with you. Our joke whenever we play a new uh, Ryan Lockett game is uh, it's set collecting and what? <laughs> yeah, set collecting and for some reason like carrot and toad people. I don't I don't get it. <laughs> All right, how about you, Christina? Um, I think 
I mean, I, I sort of agree with the general things that, that you mentioned. Um, it's not like I ever am fiending to play the things he doesn't want to play there. But <laughs> I think my – it's like a whole sort of genre for me. And, and it's just sort of like a taste, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of head-to-head uh, conflict sort of tactical games that if anything is too chess-like, it just turns me off. Um, and I know they're excellent games. And I've played some games where I like – uh, you know, I'll play some of these like uh, sort of attack type games with Shu, and I'm like, yeah, objectively, I can see that this is a good game. Um, it's just sort of not to my taste. I'd rather not have to think, you know, eight moves in advance. I like sort of maximizing uh, moves right now and in the near future and sort of guess a bit at what my opponent's going to do, but I don't want to have to plan everything out ahead of time to do well at a game. So, um, I don't. There's been a whole bunch of them, Shu, that I've played here and there, but I only play them once. Um, like I've tried to get you to play Summoner Wars, which yeah, are like yeah. you're playing these cards on a map, and these cards represent different units. So it's sort of like you're moving them a few steps at a time and attacking, or uh, Battle Lore, which is like a hex space where fantasy creatures and you have like all these units attacking each other, and you're just not into any of them, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> and then I still beat you at them, so you know what are you gonna do? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's just sort of not my cup of tea, I think. Um, I think the only one that, of those that I have sort of liked, and maybe it's because it limits the choices you have at the moment. Um, I really liked Onitama, so I'd still play that one. Um, but in general, that's sort of not my thing. Well, well, tell people what Onitama is. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Onitama is um, a really beautiful two-player game, and uh, it's it it is pretty reminiscent of chess or checkers, except it limits your movements. You're trying to move your main uh, main uh, is it. I don't know what like that your piece is called. Yeah. Your grandmaster, yeah. You're trying to move him all the way across the board um, to your opponent's side. But the interesting aspect of your move choices are that there are preset move choices that are selected from cards. And there's only a certain number of cards per game. So when you make your move, that takes it out of the available pool for your opponent. But it's going to come back in the future. So you can still plan in advance for future moves from your opponent, but it's not like I have, I know every single possible move and I have to think about 20 of them right now. So I really, really enjoy that game. Really elegant, um, beautiful game. That's an awesome game. So when I invited John and I said, is this an okay topic for you to talk about, like games that you actually don't like because you work in the industry, right? You're unlike us where we're just commentators and, you know, who are we? Just a bunch of punks doing a podcast. But you actually, you design games, you work and collaborate with a lot of these people. Uh, Some of them are under the same publisher. I'm like, are you going to have a hard time criticizing others' work? But uh, you were like, nope, not a problem. So let's hear it. Mm-hmm. Well, I usually have a pretty strict rule about saying anything negative about any board game publicly. Like privately, I'll talk to people about things that I find wrong with games. Um, but I don't like to post about it very often. Or if I do, it'll be very vague and not mention the actual game. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you brought up this topic, I could think of one immediately that's extremely popular. So I'm not too worried about it because they're they're doing fine. Um, and for me, it's too many bones. Mm. Oh, that's right. We talked about this. Yeah. Like you were arguing about this in front of us at Gen Con a couple of years ago because everyone around you loved it. And then you're just like, <laughs> it's, I don't like this game. So tell us, tell us what the game is and tell us why you don't like it. So too many bones is a game, um, from chip theory games. Um, and it, it's about playing these weird gnome type people that are going on an adventure. Um, and it has some some kind of RPG type elements, but essentially you're like leveling up your character, gaining new skills, which unlock new dice, which you get to roll and do abilities. Um, and like everything in the game is represented by either poker chips or dice for the most part. Um, and it's a beautiful presentation. When I got my Kickstarter copy, you know, opening it up was a very very pleasant experience, and it was. It's really nice to look at, but every time I played it, it felt like a chore. I think I probably played it three or four times before I traded it off. And people seem to love it, but I don't understand. (laughs) 
I just received a huge shipment from the Too Many Bones, their uh, expansion or their standalone expansion Kickstarter. So uh, I just received like 26 pounds of Too Many Bones content. So uh, yes, I picked them up and we got that giant package together. <laughs> so uh, I do remember you saying that and that, that almost kind of uh, dissuaded me from, but I'm like, it's so many people love this game. I, I need to try it out. So uh, I'll report back to you after I learned that game, which might take me a few months. Yeah, I'm excited to hear your thoughts because I, I don't know what it is about it that gets me, but it's something. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the, didn't you say it takes a long time to play too, right? Yeah, the play the playtime is very very long for what I feel that it does. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the main things. Got it. Got it. Okay. I like games that get into the action. Right. Right. Let's go to your topic then, John. Uh, why don't you remind us what that is and then start us off? Well, I want to talk a little bit about how uh, board games can evoke experiences. Um, a lot of designers will kind of classify themselves as. Uh, mechanics first like they'll start a game by coming up with a cool mechanic and then build the rest of the game about that around it or they'll start with a theme so there's theme first designers um who'll be like well i'm going to make a zombie game and then build the game around that um what i kind of consider myself is an experience first designer because i always think of not just the theme but what i want the players to feel and then try to pick mechanics and thematic elements that influence the players. I want them, when they take an action, to feel like they're doing the thing that they would do as if they were in the game. You know, I don't want them to do things just because they're mechanically needed or that don't, that kind of, because sometimes you'll play a game where actions almost, some actions will like drop you out of the fun of the game. And I think that that's an important thing to avoid. Can you give us an example from one of your more popular games so that you can kind of paint a picture for what you're talking about exactly from your point of view? Yeah. So, I mean, I think with um, Dead of Winter, the thing that I've noticed over the years teaching it is that it's it's very, very easy to teach. I can, t- I can have a group playing in about 10 minutes because you don't really have to explain a lot of the mechanics about the actions to them. You just explain, you know, these are the actions that you have to spend a, a die for. These are the actions that you don't spend a die for. And essentially for the first round, just tell me what you want to do. And we'll pick one of these actions that does it. So when you want to move, you, you know, you just explain to them how that happens. And you, they're all the things that you would want to do if you were a survivor in a zombie apocalypse. You want to move. You want to scavenge. You want to you know, clean the trash up in the colony because the, you can't let it get disgusting. <laughs> Um, so everything feels like if I was there, what would I focus on? And I think that helps gives, give the players like a really unique experience when they can just really slip themselves into the game. So I, this, I didn't talk about dead of winter earlier when we were talking about scary games, because I wanted to talk about it for in this topic specifically. Now, uh, I've said this about Dead of Winter before I met you, so I feel safe saying this without sounding feeling like I'm kissing your ass because you're on the show. <laughs> uh, but I think it's a brilliant game, uh, and I really love it. It's like the first time I played it was at a convention. I'm like, oh my god, this this is great! It's so different, and it's ev- evoking these different experiences because uh, I tell people all the time, I'm like, Dead of Winter is fantastic because it's a zombie game, yes. But it's not really about the zombies. The game isn't about the zombies at all, um, in my opinion. Right? This is my view. Uh, I'm, I shouldn't be telling the designer what the game is or isn't about. <laughs> no, no, but no. like the way I view it, I'm like, it's not about the zombies. Like the part about the parts of the game where you have to go out and like I have to sh- take care, kill these zombies before they get out of hand, or make sure I barricade these areas before the zombies break in. Yes, that's part of the game. But what you get out of it is the the dynamic between the players and i've seen very few games that does it as well as dead winter and again for everyone listening out there i've said this i christina could vouch for this i've said this long before i met john it's so true. this is not just because he's here <laughs> uh because you've created this system where you have to act selfishly but also act in the best interest of the greater of the group because it's a cooperative game but 
you're each of you, each of the players are in charge of a small band of survivors and you have to make really tough choices. Like I have a can of fuel. Do I give this to the group because the group needs it and it helps the group's goal? Or do I keep it because I need to fulfill my own, my own personal objectives. Right. And so what you create is all this tension and where people are like, why wouldn't you share this food or sh- share this fuel? Or are you holding out on us and you're pissed off at each other? But it's, it's, it's a fantastic dynamic because you start to feel like, this is how it would work if there was a real life zombie apocalypse, right? Like if the four of us were in a room in a in this outpost full of other people we didn't know, we sure we might think, okay, we're gonna do what's best for the greater good, but there might be times where we're like, you know what, my wife hasn't eaten in days, and I'm gonna selfishly keep this can of food to feed her, so I could take care and make sure I ensure her survival, and you know, screw the rest of the group because I love my wife and I have to take care of her, that, her first. So we've had a lot of interesting fights with our friends in this and arguments and all this weird tension. And it just very much feels like uh, you, you start, you draw that out of people. Like how would you act if the world was really ending and you're faced with the zombie apocalypse? And it's like almost like the zombies are secondary in this game. And it's just such a cool, cool feeling to be put in that situation and have that dynamic between the players. Yeah. When, uh, when people say I don't like zombie games, um, I, usually tell them it's not a zombie game. It's a survival game that has zombies Mm -hmm. and you know, like the best zombie movies or zombie books there. It's not about the zombies, their background noise and their ever present threat, but it's more about the humanity and the, the stories of that. And that's really what I wanted to focus on was, you know, how would it feel as a survivor to be in this? Um, you know, what kind of things do I want? And one of the times during playtesting when I knew we were getting it right is um, we were playing a game and uh, the, car, the colony is just starving. And there used to be a mechanic where you could do a specific action to look at another player's hand. Um, and somebody did the action and looked at one player's hand. And they were hoarding food. <laughs> um and then we looked at somebody else's hand and they were hoarding food too. <laughs> and there's only one secret objective in the game to hoard food. The other person was doing it just because he felt like it was the right thing to do. <laughs> and and when I saw that people were starting to make decisions based on either their morality or what they would do rather than the mechanics of the game, that's when I knew that we were in the right direction. Because I want you to make decisions that are fun and exciting and not the necessarily the mathematically best decision every moment. Yeah. That's all I, this is the last thing I'll say about this just so it's not a dead of winter podcast, but I, I once I, I invited a friend over. It's the first time I actually had him over to play games. And then my other friend, uh, our friend, Anna, uh, she ended up kind of being Kingmaker uh, for a specific reason that, didn't make sense to me, made perfect sense to her. And we argued about it for about 45 minutes after the game ended in a friendly way. We, you know, we weren't mad at each other, uh, <laughs> but I, I, we just had this long discussion. I've never had that in the game before. We we're discussing like, why did you make the choices you make? And, and whether it was right or wrong, whether it's the designer's intent or not. Um, so it, yeah, it's we can just, ask him. Yeah, we, we, we won't do it here because it's going to take too long to explain. But it, it was just a really fascinating thing because you're just... Uh, tapping into all this like the psychology and the, the, this behavior stuff that you normally don't really discuss or, or get out of a typical board game. So uh, great job on that. I just, I love that game. I think it, de- I, I think your mileage probably depends a lot about like with whom you're playing, but I did play this with strangers at the con and I still thought it was great. So uh, definitely a, a cool game on that. Yeah. My, uh, my wife doesn't like thematic games very much. Uh, and the one time, the, the, the one time I got her to play Dead of Winter, um, I saw something happen, which is she she doesn't like role playing games at all. She doesn't like anything like what she describes as anything that she has to use her imagination to play. <laughs> um, and I saw her starting to like kind of tell a story in the game, and that was really exciting to me. Um, but it was also. She uh, and it's it's a really proud moment for me, but it kind of a sad moment. Uh, she ended up crying during the game because of one of the crossword cards oh. that came up. No. <laughs> and I 
was like, oh, that's really cool as a designer to see somebody like feel real emotions over your game. I was like, oh man, my wife's crying. I should probably, <laughs> <laughs> I should probably feel bad, not good. Oh man, that's awesome. That's crazy. Um, do you have any other stories you want to share with us from your point of view as a designer? I think this is like a a great topic to hear more from you about. Yeah, so I actually think another uh, game that people you know say is a really dry Euro, but I think it's it's very heavily thematic is, is a hmm. Huh. <laughs> it's just three huh well, I, I mean i see yeah. that I, I can see some of that yeah like every time i play it i feel like a starving <laughs> farmer who's like just scraping around for my family and you know i'm not necessarily making the best decisions but i'm like man i need more cows <laughs> <laughs> and joe keeps taking all the wood <laughs> yeah so uh, for you guys what do you think some games that really bring out experiences like that are for you well, I mean, for me, I was just thinking as we were talking about or, or about, about our topics um, about how a lot of the, the sort of scary games that I like use the hidden movement mechanic uh, to sort of evoke fear and the sort of sense of like a foreboding sort of like, you know, evil presence that you can't quite see. Because like I was thinking of games like, you know, Fear of Dracula is one, but then, um, you know, Letters from Whitechapel and then the sequel Mystery of, at Whitehall. Um, which both talk about Jack the Ripper and like how and and one player plays as Jack and they're they're not they're not on the board either and the other players are trying to find him and then Nyctophobia is another one that I was thinking of um, and how like you're supposed to wear the you wear three or you know several of the players wear these glasses and then one player plays the hunter who's hunting down these players uh, and so it's all about like what you can't see and so I, I like how like these these games, I think you, know, you have to make clear though those glasses are not, are opaque. You can't see through. Them. Yeah, they're 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 blind. They're you. completely blind, you know, blacked out glasses, and so they can't see the board. And the the hunter has to move their hand to their piece, and mm-hmm. um, and then at some point, sometimes the hunter will will lie to them, and t- and like they're they're supposed to lie and like tell them you know whatever they want, and they can come up behind them and hit them with an, an axe or whatever. But basically, all these games that I that I find fun for a, for a, you know a scary night uh, night of gaming all use the same mechanic of like, you know, preventing the, some of the players, most of the players on the board from knowing what's going, you know, having, having not, not all of the information uh, in front of them. And so using that sort of hidden movement uh, to, to scare people and create a mood, I think is really interesting. Yeah. I think uh, even with games like werewolf that are a lot lighter, I think they have that same element of the unknown that really can be terrifying at times. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you close your eyes and werewolf and you're not a werewolf, you know, you don't know if you're going to make it to the morning. And that that can be scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I don't think I, I just don't think rolling dice makes it very scary. And I don't think, you know, worker placement is a good mechanic to use for that scary. But I mean, maybe there maybe there is a way to do it that would make a, a game more scary. Um, but I think, you know. One element, one mechanic that I haven't seen used uh, or has underused in, in horror games, I think, is card drafting. Um, I think in a certain way, like Werewolf uses it in some ways to sort of find out what character you are. But you have to write that yeah. down. How about you, Christina? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, definitely like Nyctophobia is, is like a all experience. I think for sure it was really interesting. And I know, um, you know, the designer wanted to um, give people that feeling of being blind because she made this game for her um, uncle or I think it was her uncle, John. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, which was really, really awesome. Um, I think for who me, is blind. I, who is blind? Yes. <laughs> um, I think, you know, not speaking of the, the hidden role mechanic as much. I, I really like a lot of legacy games um, these days where, where you get that narrative because you start being very invested in your, in the player that you are uh, in the character you're playing. Um, I always talk about, you know, when people ask me, what's my favorite game, uh, my favorite gaming experience was definitely pandemic, like pandemic legacy season one. Um, it was just so, um, interesting it was like i was playing a movie and like all these twists and turns in the narrative were really really great and oh my gosh like asia's going down are we going to have to like you know nuke istanbul oh my god there's all these decisions to make and we can't keep everybody alive so what are we gonna do um and and i think that cooperative feeling um as a legacy game is really really great for me 
because uh, because you're you're in it together. You're playing with a consistent group, and uh, some of those games are just uh, so interesting in how your experience is so different from you know another playing group's experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one where if people aren't familiar with what a legacy game is, this is where you you play several sessions like or like a season of this of a campaign and the game changes and you make permanent changes like you might rip up cards you might open up secret boxes you might unlock things that you didn't know were there previously you might write in permanent marker on the board so it changes but they uh I don't I don't even understand how you really designed this game because it seems so complicated to me like to have to figure out like all right no matter what the outcome is, whether you win or lose or win badly or lose badly uh, or win by a lot, whatever, and then you have to go into the next month of this campaign that it's it's still seamless and they can still add their twists and turns and they still make it work. Uh, so, yeah, and there's definitely like exciting moments that I still remember from that campaign. And then uh, and then when you're done, it's like you feel like you just went to battle with your friends and then you just like kind of all sit back and you you just have a big smile. You're just like, wow, we just went to war together. And it's like this huge stressful thing that we played over a few months and, and now it's over and it's concluded and so satisfying. Uh, that, that was a great, fantastic experience. Did you, did you guys play uh, Mike and John? Have you guys played pandemic season one? Uh, no, I haven't finished it. I started it and then we moved and we didn't pick a bad drop. I need to. Yeah. yeah, I'm in the same boat. We played it with another couple, my wife and I, and we've only made it to October, I think. So we, we've been sitting on, you know, October, November, December for the last like year. <laughs> yeah, I think in general too, like, like exactly like what she was saying, the, that shared experience um, while you're like struggling together is, is something that sticks in my mind. I, I mean, it also reminds me of, of course, Dead of Winter, where there was also that, you know, you know, is are they really on my side? Like, what are they really doing here? Um, and then um, Robinson Crusoe also oh, yeah. came to mind when I was thinking about this. Um, I really liked that mechanic or sort of like the crossroads sort of mechanism, but also uh, where if you make a decision, it could come back in the f- in, later on um, and, and have some consequences that totally narratively make sense, but you're like, oh, crap, that sucks. <laughs> um, so I, I really liked that aspect of Robinson Crusoe. And it was really hard too, so... Yeah. Yeah, that's a good example of one where at Gloomhaven had that too, where you might have an encounter and you have to make a decision. And then later on in the game, you might, it might come back and say to you like, oh yeah. And, um, uh, was it near and far Christina from Ryan Lockett had sort of the same thing, right? Where I made a decision early on as my character and then it told me to write this thing on my character sheet. And then later on, uh, I kept having a specific storyline only for me because of ch- certain choices that I made. Because basically, I was a killer robot, <laughs> and then uh, and then the game remembered that I was a killer robot and kept presenting me with things that only the killer robot would see. So <laughs> that was really super cool. Uh, I, I love when games do that and do it well. All right, cool. Well, uh, that was an awesome discussion. Uh, Thank you very much. So uh, we appreciate everybody listening to the podcast. We appreciate any likes, subscriptions. But before we sign off, uh, we just do this quick wrap up of we'll go around the table real quickly and just have everyone say a few last words. Anything you want to talk about, like a cool game you might be playing, something else that you want to just throw out there real quick. Uh, Not quite a full topic, but just a quick little something, something. So, John, do you have any last words for us? Uh, uh, no, it's super awesome to be here. I guess I do. Uh, super awesome to be here. And uh, if, if anybody will be at Metatopia or Pax Unplugged, those are the next two uh, conventions I'd be at. So I'd love to play games with anybody who happens to be there. Cool. cool. And John is like the nicest person ever. So you should totally say hi. <laughs> Absolutely. Please do. And then how about you, Mike? Uh, yeah, so just following up with my um, scary game, The Fury of Dracula. The fourth edition of, Sc- of Fury of Dracula is actually coming out in November, supposedly, according to WizKids. And they just took over publishing duties. And uh, it's going to come with brand new minis that are pre-painted. So if anybody's looking to get a copy and is having a hard time, then uh, fret not because it's going to be out soon and it's going to look really good. <sighs> oh, I didn't even know about this. Uh-oh. It's like, uh oh, <laughs> Christina's I, just sighing. I, 
I saw the second edition, got the third edition, and then now there's another edition coming out. There's no point in you playing it. You know we're just going to kill you because you're Dracula. So <laughs> hey, last time I won as a hunter, so there's that. So, all right, and then Christina, any last words from you? Um, don't buy the fourth edition of uh, Fury of Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I don't have much to say uh, other than there's a game I brought up earlier that I'm really digging. And I guess he didn't like that much, Mike Ike, Quambra. Uh, I didn't. From I didn't dislike it. I just uh -huh. I think you hyped it up a lot. So uh, in my head, it was maybe a little bit, you know, overhyped, but I, I enjoyed it. And I'm going to continue to hype it because I just played it again uh, two nights ago and it still brings a smile to my face when I play it. This is like a. Uh, we talked about it in an earlier episode, so I'm not going to get into it now. But uh, if you like heavier European style games, uh, uh, this with a dry theme, but this one has a lot of color to it, um, bright colors, which is unusual for games of this genre, uh, go check it out. There's also that other one, Christina, you and I played that uh, James Hudson from Druid City Games introduced to us. Um, you say it. <laughs> it's Rajas of the Ganges. <laughs> Uh, or Rajas something? Rajas of the Ganges. Yeah. Ganges? Yeah. Ganges. 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 Okay. Yeah. So well, thanks, Joe. <laughs> she doesn't believe me when I say no, it's pronounced No, but you were Ganges. pronouncing it even weirder than that earlier. <laughs> anyway, um, I really liked it. For me, I, I, I liked it even more than Quambra, which I enjoy. Um, but it just had this really interesting win objective instead of just like, uh, get the most points, you have to get a lot of fame. You, you're winning with a, basically a combination of fame and money. And so you could choose either path um, or do both really well. Um, but that's it's sort of a race to have these two tracks meet, which was very different from um, any other game I've played. And I really enjoyed it. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And I, I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm, we're over. The show's over, but I can't believe we didn't talk about Tales of Arabian Nights oh. as, uh, as a board game experience. It's a cool game that evokes different experiences. Uh, I, did we talk about Tales of Arabian Nights in a previous episode? We've talked about it a few times, I feel like. Okay. I think All right. Okay. That makes me... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes you feel better. Go listen to our old episodes. Go look it up online. It really great really different kind of game that it, you can have a bunch of stories coming out of it to talk about for a long time I, I know it's done that for us uh check it out if you can it might be hard to find but really cool game all right John. yeah it's out of print right now is it what sorry I, I believe it's out of print right now yeah yeah it's gonna be hard to find but super cool game do you like it john oh i love it we actually uh for a long time stopped playing it for points because you know in the beginning where you like set your two scores to mm -hmm. decide who wins we just threw that aspect of the game out and said, all right, we're going to play this for an hour and a half and then oh, end our stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. And we didn't care about the winning or losing. We just cared about telling a good story and having fun. That's how I prefer to. I wish more people played board games that way because that's that's kind of the way I feel about a lot of games. Yeah, it's a very, very cool game. All right. Well, thank you all for coming again. Uh, if you're listening and you like what we're doing, we'd appreciate any shares, likes, subscriptions, uh, telling your friends about the show, feedback. You could find us on social media, on Twitter and Facebook at Going Analog Show, or you could send us email at letters at goinganalogshow.com. So thank you for listening. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with some new topics, and we hope you'll tune in then. Thanks a lot.